do want to start with just a few announcements about what we have coming up in May. Uh, on May 11th, out at our Appomattox Museum, we will have a talk uh, called Virginians in Blue with Kevin Troyer, who's the president of the Lynchburg Civil War Roundtable. And then our virtual program for the month is going to be on May 18th, which is also a Thursday evening at 6.30. ACWM's own exhibits curator, Dr. Chris Graham, talking about his newly published book, Faith, Race, and the Lost Cause, Confessions of a Southern Church. <laughs> and then finally, uh, we'll round out the, uh, the month and also our spring lecture series on May 25th. And Chris just missed me uh, talking about his program. So. <laughs> but on May 25th, uh, we'll be back in this space with Dr. Gary Gallagher as uh, he talks about the Union War. So we've got lots of great programs coming up uh, in May, and uh, we'll continue uh, to have programs throughout the year. So uh, keep in mind that all of the programs that we offer are free to members. So it's a great time to think about membership, uh, not only because it's a good cost-effective option, but it's a way to support the work that we're doing here at the American Civil War Museum. And now uh, for tonight's program, it is my great honor to introduce Dr. Martha S. Jones. She is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. She is a legal and cultural historian whose work examines how Black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy. Jones is the author of four books, including Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America, which was the winner of numerous prizes and published in 2018. And additionally, she has written for the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, USA Today, Public Books, Talking Points Memo, Politico, The Chronicle of Higher Education and Time. And she is an expert consultant for museum, film, and video productions, and serves on numerous boards and committees. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Jones. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I, anybody who <coughs> listen um, knows how thrilled I am to be um, back here at the American Civil War Museum. Um, last time I was here, the place that you all are sitting in um, was a construction site. <laughs> Um, so it's incredibly um, uh, exciting and impressive um, to be back here um, and to see this project come to fruition and have a chance to talk with you all um, about the Dred Scott case and more, I hope. Um, Kelly's asked me to talk for about 30 minutes, um, which will leave us plenty of time for questions and conversation and discussion. So, um, so keep your thoughts active, and I really look forward to hearing um, what um, my conversation um, brings up for you all. When I finally started to take up the Dred Scott case in my own work, um, and I come on the heels of really generations of historians who had looked at Dred Scott, my goal was a very specific one, and it was to discover um, how black Americans, um, particularly in the 1850s and 1860s, experienced that case in their daily lives. Um, how, my question was, did Justice Tawney's now notorious pronouncement, right, that no black American could be a citizen of the United States, how did that pronouncement figure um, beyond speculation, beyond political rhetoric, what was the effect of Dred Scott in everyday life? One answer, as I'll explain this evening, is very little. Dred Scott, as it was intended to impede the lives of black Americans, to exclude them from the rights that were protected in courthouses, um, had little effect. We might even say that the case was a failure, so much so that its principal author uh, the Supreme Court's Chief Justice, Roger Tawney, um, grew markedly despondent in the wake of Dred Scott. 
as the decision was not enforced and not respected. Another answer, as we'll see as well, is that for Black Americans, Dred Scott was only one or the next in a series, a long series of confrontations in courthouses, but also in legislatures and in everyday life, confrontations over whether they could be citizens. Sometimes they won those fights, other times they lost, but Dred Scott didn't bring on a crisis of new import at all. Instead, it marked one moment, a key <coughs> moment, but only one moment in an ongoing struggle over the belonging of black Americans. It was a fight that did not ebb, it turns out, in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision. In a sense, Dred Scott only fueled uh, resistance to the notion that black Americans were not citizens. And still, somehow, um, Dred Scott looms large um, in our histories, but also in, I think, in our 21st century political and legal imaginations. It is one of a handful, I think a small handful, of US Supreme Court decisions <coughs> that many, if not most, Americans recognize. Um, at the same time, um, we recognize it and revile it nearly universally, both on the left and on the right. Um, Dred Scott's legacy is not only a result of its causal relationship to the start of civil war, though I hope we'll talk about that, its legacy is in having defined what for us even today is a constitutional low point, um, one that serves up for us even now uh, a sort of cautionary tale. So by 1857, when Dred Scott was decided, contests over black citizenship had been raging for a very long time in the United States. Black Americans were intent on pressing the question. In fact, since the 1820s, they had been arguing that the plain language of the Constitution already promised them citizenship. They recognized that the Constitution, as a text, was generally silent about who <coughs> was precisely a citizen. But when they dove into the text, they discovered some clues about that question. Article 2, Section 1 provided that the president to hold office must be a natural born citizen of the country. And these words, Black American Reason, evidence that there was such a thing as a natural born citizen. Um, or what they came to term birthright citizens, um, there was such a thing that was contemplated and even provided for by the framers of the Constitution. They also read the Constitution to discover that there was no color line. Um, the Constitution did distinguish between people, free and enslaved, um, Native Americans, but free black people, as they began to press their claims as citizens, observed that they were, in the terms of the Constitution, not unlike the president. Um, they were citizens by virtue of birth in the United States. Some of the activism, the early activism on this question, um, centered in uh, what is today my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, a home, the hometown, uh, both to Justice Roger Tawney um, and Frederick Douglass for a time, and we'll come back to Douglass in just a bit. Um, but for a long time, beginning back in the 1820s, um, black activists in Baltimore had entered the fray and the debate about citizenship. Um, one of them, the great educator, newspaper correspondent, and minister, uh, AME minister, William Watkins, um, made good trouble in Baltimore beginning in the 1820s under the auspices of his Legal Rights Association. He worked on this birthright citizenship theory, um, consulted experts like Attorney General, U.S. Attorney General William Wirt, who was a Baltimorean and had retired there. He called on him, paid $50 for an opinion about black citizenship. He challenged local ordinances that distinguished between black and white uh, people in the city of Baltimore, imposing curfews, for example, on black residents. Wert, uh, excuse me, uh, Watkins thought this was impermissible in the face of the Constitution. So 
these are critical years for generating new ideas, and they also happen to be critical years for then a young enslaved man named Frederick Bailey, um, who we will come to know as Frederick Douglass. By the 1850s, Douglass, of course, was recognized as having one time been an enslaved person, um, but a, by then an independent and highly influential thinker on many questions, including questions about the Constitution and citizenship. Um, he promoted the birthright theory on the pages of his newspapers, um, and he was a leader in an African-American political movement of the period, uh, the, co the Colored Convention Movement. Um, there in 1853 in Rochester, New York, where Douglas eventually settled, uh, delegates from around the country came together um, to talk about their own condition and they looked closely, once again, at the text of the Constitution. Douglas headed a committee that prepared a report, an address to the nation, um, looking to defeat discrimination against black Americans. Um, it was an address to the people of the United States. And they said what William Watkins had begun to say really decades before, that black Americans were not aliens or exiles, they were American citizens asserting their rights on their own native soil. Douglas writes, we would first of all be understood to range ourselves no lower among our fellow countrymen than is, than is implied by the high appellation of citizen. By birth, we are American citizens. By the principles of the Declaration of Independence, we are American citizens. We are American citizens by the meaning of the United States Constitution. If black Americans were adamant about their status as citizens, American lawmakers were frankly confused. Lawmakers in both Congress and in state legislatures again and again in these years fumbled when they tried to settle the question of black citizenship. They left the political elite, merchants, lawyers, philanthropists to devise their own approach to the question. And this most popular solution was known as colonization, a plan to remove black Americans from the United States. The American Colonization Society was founded in 1816, and it committed not to black citizenship, but to preserving the United States as a white man's country by ensuring that black Americans not only would not be citizens, ensuring that they would be vulnerable to removal by coercion, by force and more from the United States. Um, here, colonizationists are the largest political movement in the US in the decades before the Civil War, um, crossing boundaries of political parties, cross, uh, crossing the borders of what becomes thought of as North and South. Colonizationists are of the view that black Americans must not be citizens. Um, to make them citizens would give them perhaps the right to refuse this movement that sought to remove them from the country. So the stage for Dred Scott is set. Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney knew well the aspirations that free black Americans had long had. As far back as 1832, Taney as US Attorney General had been confronted by the question, are black Americans citizens? Here, the case involved a black man who was slated to pilot a ship along the nation's coastal waters. But federal law reserved the right to pilot such ships to citizens. Tawney got the case, penned an opinion, and was clear, even then, decades before Dred Scott, of the view that black Americans were not indeed citizens. He continued in his role as Chief Justice in 1849. He decides what are remembered as the passenger cases, cases that determine questions of immigration, migration, and movement both into the US and around the country. And again, Tony scoffs at the idea that black Americans have anything like citizenship rights that would entitle them to move, whether it is um, from the Caribbean to the United States or it is from New York to Ohio, um, he was clear in his own reasoning that this was impossible. The Constitution guaranteed black Americans nothing. 
So by the time we get to Dred Scott, a dispute that involves an enslaved man from Missouri or in Missouri who claimed to be free, um, Dred Scott did not exactly plan on claiming citizenship. His foremost concern was that he was being held and along with his family as a slave. Um, he was not a slave, Dred Scott argued, because he had with his owner, um, with the full knowledge and in the company of his owner, he had traveled to free soil, the Wisconsin Territory, what is today's Minnesota. And by 1846, nonetheless, he's being held as a slave and on the horizon in the family that is holding the Scots is the likelihood that they are going to be sold and separated. He comes first into the Missouri state courts. He loses his claim to freedom there. He then comes to the federal courts um, and sues again. And this is where the question of citizenship rears its head because the federal courts um, are limited in their jurisdiction. And Dred Scott can only sue if he is a citizen of the United States in a federal court when he is challenging uh, Mr. Sanford, who is from New England. Um, his case arrives in the Supreme Court and Justice Tawney directs his attention directly to that question that has been roiling. Um, can Dred Scott, and by implication, any black American be a citizen of the United States? And Justice Tawney's answer is no. This blow is, uh, this decision is a blow to black Americans, no doubt. Um, Dred Scott himself, of course, and his family remain enslaved um, until they are able to purchase their freedom subsequent to the decision. But for men like Douglas and other black activists, um, the decision is a blow. Um, even as it might have been anticipated. And still, when we look at the decision in Dred Scott, part of what we discover is that even within the tight-knit circle of the U.S. Supreme Court, trouble is brewing over this question of black citizenship, and not everyone agrees with Justice Tawney. Um, Justices Curtis and McLean pen long written dissents which argue that free black Americans were indeed citizens of the United States, um, going directly counter to Justice Tawney, and as importantly for our story tonight, agreeing with men like Frederick Douglass, who have been advocating that they are citizens of the United States. These are justices who are of the view that there is no intermediate or in-between status in the United States. And black Americans are not aliens. They are not denizens. They are not wayfarers or travelers. Um, and there is only one possibility, and that is that they are citizens. So for the Scott family, this dispute does not end on the pages of Dred Scott, nor does it end for men, men like Frederick Douglass. And Douglas misses no opportunity to contend the decision, an open and glaring and scandalous tissue of lies. Um, he berates Tawny um, for his lack of imagination, his lack of intelligence, and more. Um, it is a pitched moment in the story of this confrontation, um, but it is hardly the end of the discussion. And in subsequent months, part of what we discover when we follow the life of Dred Scott out of the U.S. Supreme Court and into lower federal courts, federal courts that are still seeing black litigants come in to make claims um, in front of them, we discover that there are almost no courts that are willing to enforce Dred Scott. They begin to parse the language carefully. And for example, um, one of the U US Circuit Court in Indiana says, um, well, um, Dred Scott only applies to people who are pure Africans. Another court says, Dred Scott only applies to people who were once enslaved. And we have free African Americans who have never been slaves. So you can see how um, local federal courts and state courts as well are working very deliberately to get around Justice Tawney's reasoning and to continue to permit black Americans to come into the courthouse and to pursue their claims. 
just as Tawny is, as I suggested at the outset, um, despondent. Um, in his personal correspondence, we see notes to his confidants, um, his, um, his, uh, his sense of his authority as the chief is really shaken by the ways in which Dred Scott is unenforced in the wake of the decision. He's so despondent that he pens a 50 manuscript page document that he calls the supplemental opinion. He re-argues the case for himself and um, explains to a confidant that he's taken the trouble of penning this supplemental opinion, um, waiting for the opportunity for the next Dred Scott case to come before him um, so that he can re-make his argument more, more effectively, more strongly um, than he had the first time. Um, but he never has the chance. And we only discover the supplemental opinion, and it is only published after his death in the 1870s um, by his first biographer. And so this is, for Justice Tawney, it remains um, one of the low points and one of the great disappointments of his years on the bench. Part of what we all know about Dred Scott decided in 1857, it has a very short life. Um, because by 1861, with the outbreak of the Civil War, the kinds of questions that black Americans had been urging on the nation for decades are now going to move to center stage. By 1862, Abraham Lincoln's attorney general, Edward Bates, is going to be confronted with a version of that question that Justice Tawney had answered decades before. Can black men pilot ships off the coastal waters of the United States? And Bates flips the script and says, yes, they can. And he pens a long treatise on the question of black citizenship, making the case that black Americans are indeed not denizens, not aliens, not wayfarers, not travelers, but by birthright citizens of the United States. He is borrowing that logic that men like Frederick Douglass had crafted over those many decades. He is pulling on those dissents in the Dred Scott decision and making them the law of the land as early as 1862. He breaks with that past and here black Americans are emboldened. By 1864, they are meeting in a national convention um, in the latter years or the latter months of the war. Um, the 13th Amendment um, is uh, present in their minds and they're thinking hard about citizenship. And now they have an ally like Bates um, they have high expectations of the post-war Congress, and they continue to press this question. And we see how it gets traction. By 1866, um, the first of the Civil Rights Act will provide that all persons born in the United States are citizens of the United States, irregardless of color, irregardless of race, irregardless of previous condition of servitude. Now, Douglas and those ideas of the black conventions are at the center of the work of Congress. By 1868, as you all know, um, these same words will become um, the first provision of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, the birthright principle that had been at best ambiguous in the original Constitution is going to be front and center in the 14th Amendment. This is the dream. This is the goal. This is the vision that black Americans have had. Um, and even in the face of Dred Scott, um, this vision has been sustained. And now, in the wake of the war, enjoys a kind of supremacy. I'm going to take just a few more minutes because I promised at the beginning that we talk about how is it that such a, a, a notorious, offensive Supreme Court decision like Dred Scott continues to be a part of our political and legal lexicon even today. Um, well, one answer to that question um, takes us back to Frederick Douglass. Um, and you know that Douglas, um, in the wake of the war, will become a statesman, a political leader of extraordinary proportion, a voice to whom the nation turns on many questions. Um, and by the 1890s, while um, age is very much 
um, evident, um, whether it's in Douglas's white hair um, or in his wisdom, um, Douglas is now beginning to speak in opposition to a new scourge that is visiting the nation, and that is the rise of Jim Crow, of segregation, of racial violence, of disenfranchisement. And when he does so, um, it turns out that Douglas revives Dred Scott um, for the purposes of his um, uh, political rhetoric, his um, ability to persuade the nation against the rise of Jim Crow. Um, he begins to speak about Dred Scott as a historical low point in the nation's history, um, a shame in the early history of the nation. And he warns right, that the turn to Jim Crow, the rise of segregation, the rise of racial violence, the rise of disfranchisement threatens to take the nation back to a low point that was Dred Scott. And so he teaches a new generation of Americans what Dred Scott was, um, what it meant to men like Douglas, this denial, this refusal um, of black citizenship. And it becomes a kind of refrain in Douglas's work again and again in his speeches and in his writing. He is clear um, that this is the low bar. Dred Scott is the low bar. Um, it is the place to which we cannot return. Um, and in doing this, he is no longer speaking to audiences about the fine points of constitutional jurisprudence at all. Um, he is creating a kind of myth of Dred Scott um, that he hopes will be useful in shaming the nation into turning its back on what we all know. And Douglas, of course, does not live to see, um, which is the firm instantiation of segregation um, by the US Supreme Court in 1897. His terms, his terms, his argument falls on deaf ears at the um, US Supreme Court, um, but his political rhetoric um, lives on um, until today. And I hope, um, if you take away nothing else from our time together, um, that the next time you hear Dred Scott invoked, um, as you surely will, um, as our Supreme Court and its um, decisions in the 21st century are debated, are challenged, are resisted, and more, um, you will hear um, the comparisons to Dred Scott, these decisions as Dred Scott-like um, and you will remember um, Frederick Douglass as having, um, in a very, um, uh, I think, in a very fascinating way, having bequeathed that to us. So for black Americans, Dred Scott was neither um, the beginning or the end of the questions that the case posed. Um, instead, it was a milestone, um, a way station, um, a critical juncture, um, but really, um, no longer, I think, can we tell the story of Dred Scott as simply um, that of how highly placed jurists thought about what were um, essential, critical, and pressing questions of the decades before the Civil War. Um, we now can understand the ways in which the questions that animated Dred Scott, that vexed Justice Taney, were really the questions that black Americans had been asking and would continue to ask even in the face of Justice Taney's brutal uh, pronouncements. So I think with there, I'll stop, Kelly, because I'm probably at time and say thank you all very much. And I look forward to um, the conversation and questions and more. So thanks very much, everybody. It's very nice to be with you and, and especially to have you back with us. And as you were uh, talking about the, um, the Dred Scott case and uh, you mentioned Dred Scott's family. And some people may not be uh, familiar uh, with his family. So could you just talk a little bit about, uh, about that and maybe uh, why he chose the, the moment that he did to mm -hmm. sue for freedom? Yes. Um, so by the time the Dred Scott decision is arrived at in 1857, 
Um, Scott is married. Um, he has a wife, Harriet, um, and they have two young daughters. Um, they have, um, since 1846, been pursuing their freedom claims because both Dred and Harriet had, um, in the company of and with the consent of their owners, traveled to free territory. Um, their argument was an old argument and for a very long time a successful argument that when enslaved people in the United States found themselves not as fugitives but by by virtue of an owner's permission um, in the company of an owner, when they found themselves on free territory, they themselves became free. They had a claim to freedom. Um, now, there is important um, work, historian uh, Kelly Kennington, for example, who has looked at the Missouri cases that preceded Dred Scott, some 300 freedom suits that preceded Dred Scott's case, um, all of which rested on this free soil claim, and nearly all of which succeeded. So the Scots have high expectations um, that they indeed are going to win their freedom on this argument. Um, and I think there are two questions that flow from that. Why don't they win? Yeah. Um, partly um, because it is 1857 and not um, 1846, not 1836. And the tensions around slavery, its future, its expansion are greatly heightened. Um, and the Missouri courts are going to begin to turn their back on the free soil principle and really close the door on manumission, um, not completely, but narrow the openings for manumission. That's one thing. Yeah. I think the other thing, and now I'm going to say something that I have very little evidence for, but you'll bear with me because it is very much my sense that the Scots anticipate um, that there is going to be some disruption, perhaps death, in the family that owns them. It is very, very common then for, in the process of working out an estate, for families to be separated, spouses to be separated, parents separated from children. This is one of the greatest fears that enslaved people carry with them. Um, and so I think there's generally that. And their daughters are coming of age. And so who they have in their household, and not only the Scots, um, but two girls who are going to be especially vulnerable to exploitation. Um, in, a, in a slave market. So that is me, if you will, editorializing. Um, but I think, I hope it's an astute observation of where they were, why they waited, why, and still why there was an urgency. And I think that, I think that definitely makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And uh, it also makes me think about in our exhibit, one thing that we have is a, um, a announcement for public sale. And it lists uh, children and their ages yes. on there. So yes. to no just longer think about of family units, right? Right. Like regarded as commodities mm -hmm. that can be sold in many yeah. kinds of directions. Yeah. Another thing uh, that you mentioned uh, as you were talking is that the Dred Scott decision wasn't enforced. And I have to say that when I read about that in your book, I was I was a little surprised. And I don't know uh, why I had never thought about that. I guess I always assumed it had been enforced. But why wasn't it enforced? What is kind of the reasoning behind that? Yeah. Um, well, the first thing to say is I was surprised also. Right? So um, I, 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 I shared that sense because Dred Scott looms so large in our sensibilities. Um, one would expect to find the doors closing for black Americans in courthouses um, in the wake of Justice Taney's decision. Um, the best example we have of why comes um, again from the state of Maryland. Um, and this is, this is important not only because I'm from Maryland, though that's important. It's important because Justice Taney is from Maryland and he is much admired in his home state, as you might imagine. But when, in 1858, Maryland's high court has the opportunity 
to adopt the reasoning of Dred Scott and to enforce that reasoning and to exclude African Americans from the state's courts, they say no. Why? Now we get the full-throated reasoning. Um, Justice Legrand um, says two things. Um, one, how would we expect people to work if they don't have the ability at the end of the day to protect their persons and their property? What incentive do men have to labor if someone can seize their wages, seize their property, um, and more um, without recourse? And we expect free African Americans, and in Maryland, that's 90,000 people wow. by the end of the 1850s. We expect free black Americans to be workers for wages. They are part of the engine of prosperity in our state. And we cannot deprive them of the incentive of work. The second thing Legrand says is, if we exclude black Americans from the courthouse, we will in one grand gesture create 90,000 outlaws in the state of Maryland. People who have no capacity to raise disputes, um, to resolve disputes within our system, well, they are still gonna have disputes, you can be certain, um, and those things are gonna wind up on our streets, right, and not um, in courthouses. So closer to the ground, Justice Legrand sees the dilemma of the 1850s, sees free African Americans in a way I think that mm -hmm. Justice Tawney no longer can quite see them as sort of living, breathing, a living, breathing presence mm -hmm. in the everyday life of a state like Maryland. But Legrand can, and he refuses the logic of Dred Scott and keeps the door open to black Americans so that they can use the courts in the state. And that's why Dred Scott doesn't get enforced. So it's more of a practical reason as opposed to any push for equality. Or... Thank you, and that's very important, right? So the kinds of arguments that black Americans are making, um, men like Douglas are making in the colored conventions are a companion to this, but you are right to underscore Justice Legrand is He's, he's really uh, intellectually, politically, um, and morally even a man very much like Tawny, um, but he has a, a different kind of job to do. Um, and that means not incorporating Tawny's reasoning into his jurisdiction. And as you're talking about Tawny, was he a slaveholder? Tawny, Tawny, Tawny had been a slaveholder. Uh, is that a tongue twister? I don't know. <laughs> uh, Tawny had been a slaveholder early in his life, um, but he was a part of a generation of Marylanders um, who by the 18th century um, are defining their future mostly through the professions. Tawny becomes a lawyer. Um, his brother Michael becomes a physician. Um, their father had been a planter, um, but they move away. Um, Tawny will... Um, transform the enslaved people in his family's possession um, into what in Maryland are called term slaves. So the enslaved people in the Tawny family will work for the Tawnies, some of them for many decades, um, and in exchange for a promise of later freedom. Yeah. Um, but he does not, by and large, live with or directly benefit from the, in, the labor of enslaved people, but he does for example, collect the wages of, of um, people who had formerly been enslaved by his family um, into the 18-teens and 1820s. Um, Tawny has um, uh, important and um, sustained relationships with formerly enslaved people. Some of them work for him, um, others of them um, he helps broker um, bargains around their freedom. Um, so in, during his Maryland years, he's very well acquainted with the dilemma that men like Douglas are putting on the table. Um, I think, in my view, by the time he's deciding Dred Scott, he's become somewhat of a, a recluse. He's, he's less and less um, a part of everyday life on the streets. He spends most of his time in very small quarters in Washington, um, much less time in Maryland and in Baltimore. Um, and I think 
in some sense, he's lost mm -hmm. touch a bit with um, the kind of urgencies that someone like Justice Legrand can still see. Huh. And and Tawny, he felt the need to defend his decision, and did he feel like that impacted his his reputation? Absolutely. I mean, he is despondent about the reception. Um, you know, there is public criticism of Dred Scott. Um, you know, most memorably from men like Douglas and from Lincoln. But really, I think for Tawny, the, the real wound comes from uh, other men on the bench um, who do not defer to him, do not incorporate his decision into their own thinking. Um, and he writes this opinion. Um, the gentleman who publishes, Howard is his name, who publishes the Supreme Court opinions um, in this period, a private publisher, um, works very closely with Tawny, and they go back and forth about whether or not this supplemental or speculative decision can be published in the Supreme Court reports. And Tawny's very clear that the Supreme Court reports is only for decisions of the court, not for speculation, not for promises, not for you know general thought, um, though he could have and a treatise or some other text in order to do that. Um, so he declines the opportunity to publish it absent a real case in controversy before the court. Um, and as a result, it sits in obscurity until 1872 when his wow. first biographer publishes it as an addendum to, huh. to, okay. to the text. Um, today, it, the original is in the manuscript version is in the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Um, so you can read the original, but it's been um, but now published. And so we can read it more widely. But it isn't it because I think part precisely because that first biography is a, a bit of a hodgepodge and um, not very well written, frankly. Um, and because it was tucked in the back as a supplement, I think, you know, as an appendix to the text. I think even many scholars didn't read it for a very long time. And you talked about, um, you mentioned Abraham Lincoln. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so maybe talk a little bit about how Lincoln and the Republican Party responded to Dred Scott. Did yeah. they make use of it as uh, Frederick Douglass did? Absolutely. Right, that um, there is um, an important critique of Tawney um, for the Dred Scott decision about his overreaching, right? About the gratuitousness of the Dred Scott decision, um, the formal view expressed by Tawney. Tawney's critics express a, a formalist view of how Dred Scott should have been decided, which is that if Dred Scott was not a citizen of the United States. He didn't have standing to bring a case, right? He didn't have um, the right to bring a case in a federal court. The case should have been summarily dismissed. Um, so Tawny's critics are um, very quick to point out how he has overreached um, and he has disrupted not only this question of black citizenship, but he has, um, in essence, nullified um, the Northwest Ordinance. Um, he has um, opened the door again to slavery's expansion um, without any federal um, check on its expansion in the territories. Um, but here's the thing to say, that even as Lincoln and the Republican Party are critical of Tawney and the terms of Dred Scott, they are not critical by and large on the question of black citizenship. And in fact, Lincoln, uh, and many members of the Republican Party will remain committed to the colonizationist vision um, in this period. Um, Lincoln will remain co committed to colonization up through yeah. the eve of the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah. Um, so there is no repudiation mm -hmm. of the question that men like Douglas have put on the table, are we citizens of the United States? The Republican Party remains um, committed to and um, supportive of the colonization, the colonization's vision, which is that Black Americans cannot be citizens of the United States because that would give them the right to remain in the United States. And I feel like, for at least when I was uh, in high school, what I took away from the Dred Scott case was that it did, you know, overturn the Missouri Compromise. It allowed the expansion mm -hmm. of slavery, and I don't. 
remember until you know much later ever hearing about the whole issue of citizenship yeah is, is that a is that something that's more recent or did i just miss out on that part of history well, or do a lot of people brush, um, kind of brush over the <laughs> the 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 question about yeah. citizenship yeah. and focus mm -hmm. more on the expansion element? Well, I think you know uh, one way to think about that question is to appreciate, you know, that it was always there, right? Yeah, um, yeah definitely. So part of what I think um, you're reflecting. Um, in part of the ways in which historians' questions have changed over time. Um, and um, one of the things um, that folks might not know about me, but I'll share, is that before I was a historian, um, I was a lawyer. And I wasn't a lawyer who practiced in front of the Supreme Court. I was a lawyer who practiced in local courthouses. And so when I had my chance to think about Dred Scott, I wanted to know what the case looked like and how it was experienced, not by others who also went before the U.S. Supreme Court. There are hardly any black Americans who are appearing and having their cases decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in this period. But there are many, many black Americans who are appearing in local courthouses, state and federal, all throughout this period. Um, so what was their experience is what I wanted to know, drawing on the places I had known in my own practice. And this reflects partly my own biography, but it reflects the ways in which the history of law is being rewritten today to account for the everyday experience of law, to recognize that and we, we don't, I don't have to convince you of this because you all know this in our own 21st century lives, that what the Supreme Court says and what local courts do with that um, is the subject of a great deal of consternation and conflict and more. Um, we know this, I think, best from the example of Brown versus Board of Education, mm -hmm. right? And the resistance to Brown. Um, in many quarters, despite the Supreme Court's admonitions. Um, so our approach today to the history of law has changed um, to try and incorporate and account for that complexity um, rather than an intellectual history that would sort of draw a straight line through the thinking of men like Tawny, um, though that's very interesting to me and that those disagreements between Tawny and Curtis and McLean are, are very important to the story. Um, I am as interested in how men like Douglas are interpreting the Constitution and the court. And this is an important shift in not only my work, but in the history of, of law more generally. And so does this case move the nation closer to civil war? Mm -hmm. how, does it, how does it rank as a, as a tipping point? Yeah. Um, you and I have talked about this question more than once in anticipation of this visit. Um, and um, on the one hand, um, there's no question that Dred Scott moves the nation um, in a political sense closer to the war, right? It is the sort of decision that um, further um, divides the sections, um, divides the parties and more. But I think the trouble with that analysis, if I could, sure. right, is that it, it doesn't um, account for, I think, much of the story that we've talked about tonight, um, which is to say, I don't think that that analysis um, really accounts for the degree to which um, what the possibility of civil war um, the fact of civil war, the experience of civil war is for black Americans. Um, and that is um, in that long struggle of which Dred Scott is one point, right? One chapter. Um, and so um, so I think that's why you and I, you know, could talk about it again and again, right. but really trying to hold those two stories together mm -hmm. and to recognize the ways in which um, 
when it comes to black citizenship, um, as we say about slavery's abolition, it, perhaps there was nothing shy of civil war, right? That was gonna permit men like Douglas to realize the kind of aspirations um, that they had. And we know the ways in which they add to their repertoire military service, yeah. right? As one more foundation for their claims to citizenship. Well, let's open it up to the audience now and uh, wait. I have uh, two related questions. Dred Scott uh, was owned by the Blow family and uh, grew until 18, only about three or four miles from where Nat Turner and his insurrection were. Did Dred Scott ever, I mean, his parents probably knew Nat Turner. He certainly had visited many of the houses. Uh, did he ever talk about Nat Turner? And did he ever talk about the Blow family and relationships with the Blow family who moved here? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't have very much um, directly from Dred Scott. You know, much of this story is really a story about lawyers talking to lawyers. It's a case more than um, a person. It's it sometimes, but yeah. there has been really important work on, on him and on his wife, Harriet, especially. Um, so the answer is um, no, not that I'm aware of. Dred Scott doesn't reach back to situate himself in, um, in that sort of place. Um, mm -hmm that sort of moment. Um, but his wife, Harriet, I think actually is the story that is more um, intriguing and surprising um, because um, historian Leah Vanderveld really did a deep dive into Harriet's life and persuaded me that it's likely that Harriet Scott had actually been born free in Pennsylvania um, and had not been enslaved at all. Um, and as a result, her own daughters um, should have been free people um, as Missouri law had the status of children follow that of their mother. Um, so there are some intrigues still. So Mr. Scott gives one interview very much at the end of his life and he's quite infirmed. And in fact, a reporter comes to their home. They have had their freedom purchased by this point. Um, and he, um, he is inclined to speak to the um, reporter. I think he's somewhat frail, um, and she is remembered for having sent the reporter away and, and with the admonition, in essence, leave us, leave us in peace. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't become public <laughs> figures. Um, they don't um, step to podiums. They don't pen memoirs um, and things that many others do and we rely upon. Um, and so it has been a, an important challenge to um, restore their human stories. So thank you so much for the question. Right here. Yes, I like, thank you for this incredible um, moment of history and your, your insights about the Dred Scott case. But I also was thinking about the meeting of 1862 with President Lincoln mm -hmm. and those clergymen. Mm -hmm. Can you go into detail about that? Because it is about I almost got confused about why would Lincoln have this meeting and was so adamant about trying to colonize black people into first the uh, uh, South um, Africa and then even the Caribbean. Sure. And then they pushed back. Yeah. But he couched it in a way to say, oh, well, we all know that, you know, these two races cannot live together alone. There's going to be a lot of, you know, confusion and a lot of mm -hmm. all of these things. But I think what you just said made a lot more sense. Okay. Could you talk about that? Please? Sure. And their, and their pushback was, we are <laughs> citizens. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, um, and now I am, I am drawing on um, the work of my great teacher, um, Eric Foner, mm -hmm. and his insights uh, about Lincoln. Um, and I think one of the things that Professor Foner tells us about Lincoln is how little Lincoln knew about black Americans and how little experience he had had um, as a, a real, you know, and in, in terms of real knowing, right? Lincoln knows very little about black Americans. And here he is 
right, in the, in the vice grips of war, um, and now having to understand, meet, um, and negotiate, and to consider, as he never had before, black Americans. As we've said, Lincoln is a colonizationist. Um, his vision is that the nation can somehow rid itself of black Americans. Um, and he is learning, right, in this moment that black Americans not only have legal arguments, right, but they have deeply personal and, and, and strongly held claims to their place Hopefully. as as Americans, cultural. In other words, you know, Martin Delaney says, you know, this is where we were born. Yes, mm -hmm. this is where um, our parents are buried. This is where we went to school, right? This is our home. This is not something that we intend to give up at all or give up lightly. Um, and Delaney is, is among those who really does take seriously the prospect of voluntary emigration out of the United States. So what's happening for President Lincoln? Well, part of what's happening for Lincoln is that he is waging a war. Um, he is facing challenges that are personnel and material um, and is coming to the recognition that black Americans are going to be likely essential to that effort, be it those who are enslaved and who are going to step away, secret away, and otherwise undermine the capacity of the Confederacy to wage war, or it is those who are going to do um, first the back-breaking labor of supporting um, the military, or ultimately are going to volunteer right, um, to serve in arms. Um, Lincoln is having to transform his thinking um, about not only who these men are, but what their ideas are, what their commitments are, and what their capacities are. And so we catch him right in in motion, right as a as a thinker, but also as a strategist. We know today the Emancipation Proclamation is a military order. It is not an expression of Lincoln's deeply held, long-standing moral commitments to the liberation of black Americans or certainly the equality of black Americans, but Lincoln is a shrewd strategist and he understands um, first, as he has seen through acts of Congress um, and now through his own proclamation, uh, a military way, an old military way, right? This is the, the strategy of the Haitian Revolution. This is not new, right, for those who are thinking um, deliberately and strategically. Um, Lincoln understands the capacity of Black Americans and enslaved people and former slaves um, to undermine and to undergird the war effort in important ways. And so we're seeing him, as Foner says, change in real time um, and his thinking evolve. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Such an important moment. Yes. Thank you, Doctor, for a great talk. Um, I am curious, when the case arrived at the Supreme Court, how long did it take Justice Tawney to come up with the decision? Oh, well, you know, this is one of the fascinating um, facets of Dred Scott. Um, you know, um, as is still true today, Right. The case is argued. Um, it's a long argument, an extended argument. Um, and then Tawny sits on the decision for a long time. Um, some have speculated it's um, connected to the, the presidential contest and he doesn't want to um, he doesn't want to um, trouble or interfere or add the ruling in Dred Scott to the burden of the presidential contest. Um, some historians, I'm not among them, have suggested that um, he's actually being leaned on to, to do just that. Um, but as a result, he holds the decision all the way until March of 1857. Um, and as a result, it is much anticipated, right? There is a great deal of speculation, right? That everybody from reporters to pundits um, to jurists and more uh, have had the opportunity to read the reports of the arguments. Um, there's a strong sense of where he will go, um, but he holds it for a very long time. 
um, and only fuels the interest um, in the case uh, in part by doing so. Um, the other thing that Dred Scott benefits from, interestingly to me, is um, changes in um, the technology and the, um, the rolling out of news coverage. Um, so by the time Dred Scott has decided, um, some of the major newspapers like the Baltimore Sun have correspondents in Washington committed to covering the court and getting the news out quickly. Um, so what, I can't say that that influenced Tawny, um, but it matters then for how the decision and particularly his decision um, gets very quickly disseminated. Um, so in 24 hours, 48 hours, newspapers are parsing its terms. Um, they are um, uh, pronouncing its effect. You know, and that, that goes back to uh, the earlier point, uh, Kelly, is that if you read the newspapers 48 hours, 72 hours after Dred Scott, um, particularly those who are sympathetic to Tawny's position, um, like the Baltimore Sun, they'll tell you Tawny has, Tawny has solved every quest, every problem, huh. right? Every, okay. Everything that troubles the country, particularly around questions of slavery and its expansion, um, have been settled now. Um, and if, as historians, we only read that far into the newspapers, uh, we might think that was true. Um, so part of the work, right, is to um, take newspapers, which in this period, um, nearly all of which are written from a partisan perspective, um, we have to read them against other sources in order to discern what Dred Scott actually does, as opposed to what those who read it in its immediate wake um, really hoped it would do. Doesn't turn out to do that at all. Thank you. Let's see. Hi. Yeah. <clears throat> um, people sometimes say that history doesn't repeat itself at rhyme. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, you also talked about the tipping point that this decision played into the Civil War. And so there are elements in our society today that are egging on some kind of civil war. And I'm wondering if you found or, or see any parallels with this time, any contrast and comparison that you could illuminate for us. Thank you for the question. Um, on January 6th of 2021, I'm going to really try and do this in a very uh, descriptive way. There is a event at the US Capitol. Um, some of us might call it a uh, uh, a free speech demonstration, and others of us might call it an insurrection. But among the folks who are charged with determining for all of us what that was, what it meant, um, are judges, right? Our courts. And so um, those same um, burdens, right, that get um, presented to the U.S. Supreme Court, right? those same kinds of stakes get presented, are being presented to our courts still in the week, in the wake of January 6th. Um, and uh, not only do we learn from those courts how to think about those things, we recognize, I think, the capacity or for some of us, the incapacity of our courts to arbitrate and resolve and restore right, something like a collective order and a social contract. Um, and so courts still have that possibility and still, I think, play that role. Um, you know, one of the things that is important to Justice Tawney, and I think is still important to our court today, um, is an interest in not being deemed irrelevant to the biggest questions of the day. Right? Tawney mm -hmm. wants to, in addition to a president, in addition to a Congress, Justice Tawney wants the courts to have a role in 
determining who is a citizen and who is not, in determining whether slavery expands or not and by what terms. Um, and so we watch, right, as um, our own Supreme Court, um, and I should say, I, I today I serve on the committee that, um, the President's Committee that uh, oversees the, the, uh, the, the history, the writing of the history of the court, um, that this is a, a, a court today, not unlike Tawny's court, right, that is um, sitting, it, it will be judged by history, right? We'll, we'll, we will look back and we will um, assess this time in our national history. I hope we have the privilege and the, and the luxury of doing just that as historians. Um, and, uh, and we will we will judge whether or not our courts were able to um, bind us together or, 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 or keep us apart. Um, and so, I, so the questions are different and maybe not so different um, depending on where we are and the question that's being asked. But I think um, it's no less, um, no less critical right, than it was in 1857. Thank you so much for the question. Um, you talked about Tawny's and two dissenters. Um, what was the final outcome of the entire court? And if it was, obviously, there had to be at least five, I guess, that uh, said they agreed with Tawny. Um, did they just rubber stamp it, or was there any pushback? <coughs> or yeah. was he so dominant that? Kind of took over the show, and this is this is my this is my opinion, and I'm rolling forward. Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, as best we um, can characterize the the courts, how the court breaks down, um, uh, and I'll explain in a minute why I hedge there. Um, it's a seven to two decision. So Curtis and McLean are the two um, clear dissenters, and. I'm sure I'm going to get the number wrong. I shouldn't, but I will. I think there are a total of eight opinions written in Dred Scott. So in order to, it's difficult to characterize, right, where the majorities are and how the majorities are formed um, because um, folks are not following, falling into lockstep behind Tawny. Um, and instead are parsing their own way through a complicated set of questions that are not even expressly interlocking in their terms. Um, and so it is very messy um, and very fascinating. And, um, and one of the other um, turns I think we've taken it as legal historians, um, as opposed to practitioners or um, treatise writers, um, is to read all those dissents, right? And to appreciate that they reflect um, not consensus, not even a majority view, but a really messy, divided set of minds about these very pressing questions. Um, and I think that helps us appreciate in a different way why civil war. This court is, is very divided in its thinking about the future of slavery, very divided in its thinking about the future of black Americans, um, even those who are no longer enslaved. Um, and we only appreciate that when we read the majority opinion from Justice Tony and the dissents. Now, I went to law school and once upon a time, and I suspect some people in this room may have also, and what I can tell you about the way we are trained in law school is that we only read excerpts from these cases and almost always from the majority opinions. And so there's a way in which our thinking as legal thinkers is distorted by the casebook method that truncates. We don't read all of Tawny's opinion even. We read choice bits mm. and we don't read the dissents. They're not reproduced in the case books, and you might again, give Dred Scott and Tawny's thinking um, more weight than it deserves when you don't read all of what was going on in the minds of the justices in that moment. So as legal historians, we 
have the inclination and we take the time and it gives us a different picture, I think. And the decisions are long and, you know, they're lengthy and complex. I don't want to make it sound, you know, like, you know, a great novel, um, but it is fascinating for really appreciating how fraught things were even in the wake of Dred Scott. Thank you for that. Hi. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, and this um, might be an extension of the question you just answered, but I, why did it matter to those judges in all the other smaller courts uh, to not apply, that they could not bring themselves to apply to the Scott decision? I think there are a couple of things. I, I, I mentioned one of them, you know, that these are men, and they are all men, um, who are um, charged with maintaining the peace and the social order um, in their jurisdictions, and they do not want to relegate black Americans to the streets. Um, they want black people, like they want white people, to come into the courthouse and to resolve whatever disputes they have by the, the rational, the reasoned, the contained structures of courts. Otherwise, people are going to be out in the streets, right, with muskets and pistols and, and fists, right? And, and, and this is a formula, right, for not only social disorder, but for economic trouble and more. So there's that. I think the other thing that's going on is, you know, um, and it's a little bit connected to the point earlier, Judges are still, in the 1850s, you know, still looking to establish the courts in a, in a working way as, um, as equal partners in governance to legislatures, to executives, you know, so to governors and to state legislatures, for example, to Congress and the president. president. And so... Um, there is a way in which, you know, by leaving room for black Americans, it is a way to, you know, have a large purchase on the questions of the day rather than excluding yourself and leaving those questions solely to, um, to a legislature or to an executive. So I think there's a way in which the other things going on is um, legal culture sort of coming into, um, think of men like Tawny are really, the first generation of, you know, professionalized lawyers. You know, they are the sons of planters. They are, you know, and they, and this is their domain, right? They, this is their domain. And, um, and they're looking to um, legitimize and to, um, and to uh, expand their domain. Um, and we see this very much in local courthouses. Um, where black Americans are encouraged to bring all kinds of claims and settle all kinds of disputes. And you and this is true in southern courthouses as well as northern courthouses. Um, and this is because I think judges want to be players. They want to be arbiters. They want to be decision makers. Um, they want to be part of governance. Um, and what do they have? Well, what they have is the courthouse door. And if you let people in, you get to influence a whole lot of things. If you leave people out, you will be out of the you will be out of the mix in that realm of governance. Yeah. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, this is kind of a speculative <clears throat> question. So you have the local courts, whether it's state or even federal, <clears throat> and Black Americans are filing their claims or suits or whatnot. Were there any cases moving forward that it would have wound up in an appellate court that would have then wound up in front of Tawny's court again before the Civil War right. came about? I mean, I was just curious whether was there anything that was going to wind up going right back before the court because they were saying that Black Americans didn't have standing, so to speak. Right, right. Nothing does come. Okay. That's what we know. Um, Tawny really hopes for that it's part of his disappointment and even in the 1850s this court the u.s supreme court does not have the ability 
to call cases to it, to invite litigants to come before it. It depends upon you know, a very complex you know, set of maneuverings um, and the case doesn't appear much to Tawny's disappointment. But that's what that supplemental decision was for. Was he, he was poised. Yeah. Um, and he says, you know, I've saved myself the trouble now. So when the case comes, I don't have to take time doing the research and the writing. I'm ready, I'm ready to go with my opinion. Um, but he doesn't get the chance. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jones, thank for you. being here with us tonight. <laughs> books. We have Birthright Citizens, uh, which is the history of race and rights in antebellum America. So a lot of uh, good information about you know, similar to what we've been talking about tonight. And then also Vanguard, uh, how black women broke barriers, won the vote, and insisted on equality. So if you're interested in purchasing either of these books, we have them out uh, front in the shop, and Dr. Jones will be around to Happy to do sign a few. Yeah, sign happy a few to. Books. Thank you so much, everybody. It's really great to be here with you.